come on into my kitchen and let's do a Bible study. We're, we're talking about Wives of the Bible. It's a little book I wrote a few years back. It was published by Pathway Press in Cleveland, Tennessee. And you might wonder, well, why are you qualified to teach a Bible study? Well, for one reason, I've been married to the same man for 61 years. This October 26 will be 62 years. So I think that qualifies me. Plus, I've been teaching the Bible since I was 18 years old, so that's another reason. Last week when we studied on the wives of the Bible, we studied about Job's wife, and we, we learned that she didn't even have, have a name in the Bible, and so we called her Johanna. Uh, she worked against her husband. We can learn a lot from these women. And even though she worked against him, everything that Job lost, she lost. And everything that affected him affected her, just as it affects you, whatever happens to your husband affects you as well. So we learned several things from her. Today we're going to study about Abigail. Abigail was married to a wicked man. Now, Job's wife was married to a perfect man. God said he was perfect. He was blameless. And even in all the midst of all of his troubles, he went to church. He praised God. He didn't talk bad about God. And in the end, he came out with everything restored. But Abigail, unlike Johanna, she was married to a wicked man. In fact, Nabal, I think, was an alcoholic. And he, we're going to talk about the big feast that he gave at the end of his sheep shearing that actually cost his life. Um, Abigail, did she worked against her husband, just as Job's wife worked against her husband, but Abigail was justified in what she did. Her husband did wrong. Job didn't do wrong, but Abigail's husband actually did wrong. Her husband was wealthy also. Job was one of the wealthiest men of his day, but so was Nabal, Nabal. He was a very wealthy man. He had 3,000 sheep. And, you know, there's, there's a sheep farm right down the road here. And then there's another one right down this other road. And I pass sometimes, and I look at the sheep, and I've never really counted the sheep, but I would, I would guess an estimate that there may be 30, 35, something like that. So it's hard for me to imagine and envision 3,000 sheep. And how many shepherds would you need to tend to 3,000 sheep? Well, one day Nabal was having a, I keep saying Nabal, actually in the Bible it's, it, the accent is on Na, Nabal. So I'll try to remember to pronounce his name correctly. Nabal was having a sheep shearing. It was that time of year that they sheared the sheep. And some of David's men came riding up while Nabal was working very hard and asked a favor. They said, David has sent us. We're David's men and he has sent us. And he asked that you feed us, that you give us food for him, for us, for his men. Because all through the year, we have been protecting your sheep and your shepherds. We've guarded them, we've watched over them, we've spared their lives sometimes, and we've protected them, and we're just asking for the, a favor of food in return. Well, Nabal, his name is um, means churlish or wicked. He was a very wicked man. And he said, I don't know that you're from David. I, who is David anyways? And he just blah, 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 and sent the men away and said, get out of here and let me do my work. And they left. And one of the servants tried to tell Nabal that these are David's men, and they did protect us, and they watched over us all through the year. But he wouldn't listen. So the servant ran to tell Abigail, Nabal's wife. She, and he said, we've got to do something, Miss Miss." Abigail, we've got to do something. David will bring his army and he will kill every person in this household because of the way David's, or because of the way your husband Nabal spoke to them. So she quickly loaded up donkeys of food 
she got bread and wine and fig cakes and just a multitude of things. It's all in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 25 verses 1 through 42 <clears throat> and you you'll want to read that and see what all she loaded on these ca uh, on these donkeys and had the men to take to to meet David and she got on a donkey left her house and rode toward where David was camped now David was running from Saul because Saul wanted to kill his life David had been anointed king of Israel but he had not taken over his king yet because Saul was still alive. Very interesting stories are in the Bible. Um, she rode on her donkey until she came face to face with David and 400 men that he had rounded up to go and kill her household and do away with Nabal. She got down off of her donkey she got down on her knees and then bowed down to her face before David. And she spoke such kind words to him. And she, she said, I know that God is with you and, and do I have permission to speak to you? She said, I wasn't, please don't blame me for what happened this morning. Had I known that you were there, I would have sent food. And, and now, my Lord, I have brought food for you and your men. And she said, the Lord is going to make a strong house of you because you're a godly man and you fight the battles of the Lord. And even though a man seeks to kill you, she's referring to King Saul, she said, your life is in God's hand and he will sling your enemies out like a man slings a rock out of a slingshot. And you know, David was an expert at slingshots. He had killed a giant with his slingshot and one stone. So he knew exactly how, and that touched his heart that she said that. And then she said, when you become king, as the Lord has appointed you to be, you will not have any regrets about today. You'll be glad that you did not try to avenge yourself and shed the blood of innocent people. When you become king, my Lord, remember me, your handmaiden. And then she ended her speech and raised her eyes to meet his again. David was moved. He was so moved by this woman's speech. Do you know your words are powerful? The things that you say to a man or to a husband can change their life for good or for evil. All through the Bible we see how women influenced men. That's that's just a gift that God has given us to be able to speak to people and help them. So are you helping your husband? Now, when, when she got home, Nabal's party was in full swing. The men had been cooking, some of the servants had been cooking all day. They had slaughtered many of the sheep to eat and they were, they were having a big feast and they had plenty of wine. And Nabal had eaten and drunk until he was drunk, almost passed out from drinking. She knew there was no way she could tell him what she had stopped and what he had caused from that day, that night. So she waited until morning. And, you know, it's like she kept a secret from him overnight. And it's not a good thing to keep a secret from your husband. But sometimes you have to use wisdom and not tell them things. You have to wait for the proper time. And she waited till morning. She knew that by then he would be sober. And by morning he was sober. And she told him that David was coming with 400 men to kill their household and to kill Nabal, to kill her. And that she had taken food and avenged his anger. When Nabal heard this, the Bible says he had a heart attack and he became like a stone, and he lay like a stone for 10 days, and at the end of 10 days, he died. Now, when David heard that her husband was dead, he sent his servants and asked her, would she marry him? And they brought her back to the palace, and she married David. You would think, well, that would be a great ending for her, um, 
But the Bible also says that he married another woman not long after that, so her life probably was not perfect, even though life with David would have been better living in the palace when he became king, would have been much better than her life with Nabal when she lived with a wicked man. But I want you to notice that she did not give up on Nabal. Even though he was an alcoholic, she was not the one that left. He died, and, and God worked it out for her benefit because she did the right thing. You've probably known an alcoholic. I have known a few in my lifetime. In fact, before I was born, my father became an alcoholic. I suppose he was an alcoholic. He told me he drank two-fifths of whiskey a day. I think, and he carried his whiskey bottle in the truck seat right beside him everywhere he went. And when life got too hard to face, he just took a little sip. Um, he had hurt his leg and was called a cripple, so he had a hard time walking at times, and that alcohol seemed to soothe him, and that was the reason he got into it. But one day he realized there was a God, and he realized that he didn't need the alcohol any longer. And in just one motion, once he made up his mind, he picked up that alcohol bottle, threw it out the window, and that alcohol left him. His mind was clear. He, he never drank another drop, and he hated the smell of it from that day on. Now, all alcoholics are not delivered that quickly. I've known some that it lingered for years and they tried over and over to get deliverance and to get help for alcohol. I worked with a man once in uh, Deland in the grocery store and I had to cut cheese and wrap it and the meat cutter's name was George and George worked in the cold storage room picking out the meat and then he would bring it to a place right beside me where we had to work. It was uh, behind a, a counter, but we could see out into the store. Um, as I wrapped the cheese, he would wrap his meat and he would talk. And one day he said, that, like the first day I was there, he said, let me tell you what God's done in my life. And I said, okay, and then I'll tell you what he's done in my life. And he said, well, I was an alcoholic. And when I came to work I was so drunk I could hardly stand up so I don't know how I got my job here in this store but he said I did. And he said not long after I started to work here my wife was saved. She went to a little church not too far from our house and she was saved and she started asking me to go to church and I wouldn't but the pastor came to my house and he said George Jesus loves you and he wants to help you and I want you to come to church and George said I would curse him and I'd say get out of my house and don't you ever come back and call him all kind of names but he said the next day he would come back and he did that day after day every day he came to my house every day I cursed him and told him to get out of there but finally one day I said if you will stop coming and bugging me I'll go to church one time and the pastor said okay so George said, I went to church, and I went to the altar, and I thought I got saved. I gave everything up to Jesus, and I thought I was over alcohol, but he said in a few days, I took another drink, and I was right back on it. And he said, the pastor came back, and he said, George, God loves you. Jesus loves you. He died for you. Come on back to church and let us pray for you. And he said he went back. And he continually kept falling back off the wagon and going back to the alcohol. But he said the preacher would not give up on him. He just kept coming and saying, George, come on back and let God help you. And he said, I kept going back. And finally, one night or one morning, I went to that altar. I prayed and God delivered me. And he said, now I can't stand the smell of it. And George was constantly going around to people that came in the store and they would have their buggy full of alcohol beverages and he'd say, you know, you don't have to drink that. God will deliver you. But one thing he said that I've always remembered, he said, don't ever give up on an alcoholic. 
Keep praying for them. Keep telling them that God loves them and that He will deliver them. I'm glad that Abigail didn't really give up on her husband. She did the right thing, even though she lived with a wicked man. Now next week we're going we're gonna to talk about another wife of the Bible. We're going to talk about Mikhail. And Mikhail lived with embarrassment. And you want to watch and see what the embarrassing thing happened in her life that she got so upset about. So I'll see you next week.